All right, everyone. Um, I see we have 100 people online. Actually, we have over 300 people that registered for this uh, Crossomics Festival um, this year. So I propose we get started because we stay short on time. Uh, welcome to the second Crossomics Festival, which um, we had to postpone from April. Originally, we wanted to have it uh, as a live meeting, but obviously uh, things got into the uh, got into fear. Because last year, we had a wonderful event, a full day in Nijmegen, uh, where we had uh, keynote lectures, a good mix of science, meeting, interactive sessions. And we decided this is great and let's do this every year. And then COVID came and everyone in the whole society moved to an online community, if you like. Um, and since we wanted to have our event, uh, we decided to have this Zoom meeting today. So I'm really happy that we have over 310 participants. Um, and we still have this moment that we can uh, talk science. We won't have the interactive sessions, which is unfortunate, uh, but this is second best. And uh, I think we're getting used to this and we're gonna have this for a while, I guess. So we put together a program, um, which uh, is shown on the slide as, as follows. We'll start with Professor Tim Hubbard as a keynote speaker. Uh, and Tim is from King's College London, who will talk about the 100,000 Genome Project. Then we take a short coffee break uh, and a bio break. And then we have a, a program where we have four pitches from young investigators uh, from the Crossomics Consortium, Wei Wu, Bert Wouters, Hans Wessels, and Jenny van Dongen, uh, which are mixed with three technology pitches of uh, NanoString Broker and Microsoft, who are part of the sponsoring team uh, of this event. Then we break for lunch. And we reconvene with uh, three examples where multi-omics has been applied in uh, three application areas. That is oncology by Roland Canard, metabolic disease by Clara McCarnabeek, and neurology by Ahmed Mafus. And I'll uh, wrap everything up and close it at uh, two. And I have to, um, well, we're gonna try something exciting also today be beside the content, because we're gonna try to make a group picture at 10.30. And this is, um, well, we have no clue whether this works, but with over 300 people online, it will be a sort of a Muppet show. And I'm gonna ask everyone to put on the camera at that time. Um, and if you're worried about your makeup or your hair, don't be, because all your names will be not visible um, and you will be very small as a small pixel. Um, so we'll have to see how it looks like. But um, if you don't wanna put it on, uh, that's also fine. So to reintroduce the Netherlands Crossomics Initiative as part of the introduction, um, this is a consortium which we started two years ago. It's part of the large-scale research infrastructures, which is partly funded by the Dutch uh, scientific organization NWO. And we started two years ago. Um, we got a budget of about 40 million to really make, um, to have two objectives. And the first objective is really to advance the omics technologies beyond the state of the art what it is currently, and to really establish a fully integrated uh, research infrastructure. We organized this with a number of partners, which are shown in this uh, map of the Netherlands. And uh, the consortium is led in four pillars, if you like. And genomics pillars is coordinated by Edwin Kuppen, proteomics by Albert Heck, metabolomics by Thomas Hankemeyer, and the data pillar is coordinated by Peter Brammertun. So together, um, we try to uh, reach these two objectives. Now, the Research infrastructure can be explained uh, in this following animation. What we first try to do is to um, improve the technologies on genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics, uh, as I mentioned, beyond the state of the art, both on the analytical part uh, to push uh, the resolution, the sensitivity, and the coverage um, to higher levels, but at the same time also improve the data layer at this stage already. We know that literature um, has proven not always be reproducible, and we want to harmonize and standardize our data, our omics data, right at the source. On top of that, we're going to connect those omics layers in the data um, pillar, if you like, to really combine the data analysis, integration, and data stewardship. This starts at the study design. When you have a biological question, have the proper study design and do the proper sample isolation and handling. But then also we have an ICT component and the method component to really analyze and integrate these data in a fair way. The fair principles are crucial here. And this collective we're gonna make available to the community and also organize the community um, by um, 
acting through our help desk by work, uh, organizing workshops, trainings, but also demonstrating the added value of multi-omics approaches and our capabilities to do so. And our demonstrators are, uh, are separated by the cell, the individual and the population because each of them has a different biomedical uh, need. Now this collective is uh, added with, um, um, with kind of visualizations to help the community to build it. And we're gonna organize several uh, get togethers like the symposium we have today. And I wanna point you to the Crossomics website, um, which is very simple, crossomics.nl, where you find all this kind of information, but also how to access the capabilities and information on the workshops, uh, interesting publications, events that are happening by us, but also by the rest of the field. And particularly, I wanna focus you to our brochure, which is um, uh, also available on the website itself, which contains the information on the people, our capabilities, and the way you can access um, the various tools and the methods that we have available. So I mentioned already the community because we're as good as the community uh, on the crossomics uh, is working together. So uh, we organize this through the website, but also we got a pretty active LinkedIn channel um, and we put uh, movies on YouTube as well, which is basically sharing information, exciting news, new publications, but also on the training and the workshops, but sometimes also expert posts, events that are happening in the world and um, uh, the more we reuse this and use this as a community, the better we are. Now, and particularly in COVID-19 times, um, um, we need these kind of infrastructures to really advance very fast. And what you see here are two screen dumps, one of a paper where Edwin Kappa's group uh, contributed, which in a few months actually from a concept of an idea, it was a publication in science, but also on the right hand um, is from Alexander Heuser from the Radboud, where uh, genetic variants were actually identified in young men with a severe COVID-19, which is now being translated into a diagnostic and a research test. So besides these scientific papers, our omics uh, colleagues are actually developing novel uh, screening methods where uh, we do a much faster genomic screening, but also on the proteomic and the metabolomic uh, um, area, we have novel innovative methods, which will be implemented very soon in, uh, in several screening programs. And you'll hear more about that through our channels here. Now, finally, I'd like to point you to our help desk where we can work with all researchers in our community and beyond to discuss potential research projects, but also where you have a, a question to an expert and we find the expert for you. Uh, this could be on the single analytical tools or on the multi-omics approaches. And uh, this is also the same portal to have an intake for multi-omics sample or data analysis. And with that, I'd like to uh, round off this introduction. Um, as I mentioned, the four young investigators will chair all the different lectures which you see here, uh, starting with Jenny van Dongen, who will chair uh, our keynote speaker, um, Tim Hubbard. Jenny, the um, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the next speaker is our keynote speaker of today, Professor Tim Hubbard. Uh, Tim is Professor of Bioinformatics and Head of the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics at King's College London and Director of Bioinformatics for King's Health Partners with a part-time secondment as Head of Gen Genome Analysis at Genomics England. So in his keynote, he will talk about the 100,000 Genomes Project that is being run in the UK. Thank you. Good morning. So thanks very much for inviting me. So I'm gonna talk about the 100,000 Genomes Project, which has really finished at the end of 2018. Um, 2019, um, but really about many of the things that are happening beyond that. So, um, how do I advance the slides? Um, so, of course, this all comes from the human genome. It was the 20th anniversary of the sequencing of the human genome this year. Um, and I don't think any of us thought that things would change so fast that when the first one cost billions of euros and took many, many years that we now get down to the level of below a thousand dollars and the price and the time taken of less than 24 hours. 
but that's the reality now and that enables the use of the genome in healthcare. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, this was announced in 2012 as an Olympic legacy by the Prime Minister then. Um, that led to the creation of this organization called Genomics England, which is actually a company that is wholly owned by the Department of Health in the UK. Um, there are many steps along the process, which I'll go through, but we opened a sequencing center um, for Illumina at the Wellcome Trust Sanger uh, Institute of the Genome Campus. Um, there was a report in 2017 of the whole future of genomics by the chief medical officer. And in 2018, having sequenced 100,000, the end of that year, um, it was announced that the evidence from the 100,000 genomes was enough for the health service to implement a permanent whole genome sequencing service in the health system. So that's the sort of outline of where I'm going to go, but I'm also going to talk beyond that in terms of data and Health Data Research UK. So firstly, what are you going to sequence? I think it's important to point out that we're not sequencing genomes to predict the future. Um, we don't understand the genomes well enough to do that. Um, the early phases of deciding what it could be usefully done for a health service point of view, um, targeted rare disease, cancers and infections, areas where we have individuals who are ill and whole genome sequencing can provide a useful diagnostic for those individuals. So this is a summary of the work. It's primarily a treatment project um, rather than a research project. Everything is whole genome sequencing, um, either rare diseases where you sequence trios, parents and the, the affected and two parents, um, or cancer when you sequence um, the tumor and the normal. And it had a variety of objectives, um, not just to sequence genomes to improve the health of individuals, but to create a legacy of infrastructure and capacity within the UK Health Service to use whole genomes to stimulate new companies analyzing genomes and to enable large scale research. So the three phases that we went through were a pilot in 2014, mainly through research centers. The main program from 2015 to end of 2018 through these entities that were created in the health service called genome medicine service centers. And from 2018, the plan was to switch to the genome medicine service. Now, of course, that's been delayed by COVID. And I'll come back to that. But the overall result is that we've gone from trying to sequence whole genomes in a health service at scale to embedding this permanently in the health system for clinical care and research. So this is just to go through how we built this process up. Um, so Little Genomics England, certainly a small organization compared with the whole of the health service. It's only now 200 people. Um, at the start, it was only about 10 people, um, whereas the health service as a whole in the UK, in England alone, it's 1.4 million people employed by the health service. So it's been kind of operated like a contracting service. So Genomics England launched a investigation of sequencing technologies and selected Illumina and had a contract with Illumina for sequencing. Illumina had to build a sequencing center in the UK to carry that out because all samples, all data must remain in the UK. Secondly, the health service, NHS England is the organization that runs the health service, made contracts with to create these new genome medicine centers. And these centers scattered across the whole of the UK. NHS England is England. So there were 13 centers in England, but later, um, they were joined by centers in the other three nations of the UK, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And these centers are responsible for 
identifying or recruiting people in the NHS, participants, patients, and when a result is generated from a whole genome, returning those results back to the patients. So in order to connect all this up, obviously you've got to have data center, that was another contract. Um, so you have DNA going to the sequencing center, the, the BAMs and VCFs going to the data center, phenotype data collect, collected in parallel directly from the health service, describing those patients, and then a clinical interpretation service running inside the data center as a mixture of uh, you know, um, software bioinformatics developed at Genomics England, but also interpretation providers um, contracted externally from companies specializing in interpreting rare disease and cancer. And that producing a clinical report going back to the health service. So um, what are we telling participants? It's a very narrow set of results. We're only analyzing the whole genome from the point of view of the condition that affects those individuals. There's some additional findings, but that's optional for the participants. And it's a very, very narrow set of uh, additional findings. Um, everything is governed through with both ethics and patient participation. There's a national participant panel. They have representation on all the committees that control the project, particularly in terms of data access um, for research, which I'll come to. So you've got this structure of um, for clinical clinical cycle of interpretation. Now, just to say a bit more about the interpretation, it's not just these companies. It's also a set of checks of the sequences that come back from Illumina, and also some common analysis, which is combined by the different results generated, the different formats of results coming from the companies to produce a kind of common assessment, which then goes back to clinicians. And there's an interface for the clinical service provided to the NHS so they can view the pedigrees of families, review the variants that have been identified in these reports, and you know, manage those um, for their organization. Because there's around 13 genome medicine centers but about 90 hospitals involved in this project. This is the sort of progress. It's all a bit old now since most of this was done. Um, the sequencing was finished at the end of 2018 and 2019 was the catching up in terms of processing these results and returning them to the NHS. As of um, just beginning of this year, all the results have been returned to the NHS. So we've completed that part of the project and we did sequence more than 100,000 in that process. So that's the, the clinical side. Now, what about the research side? So the key part is that, um, that the data center, which holds this data, is also accessible for researchers um, on the same basis that the data cannot be moved. The data center lives effectively within the firewall of the NHS, but we have a research environment that allows um, researchers and um, companies to log in and do analysis inside that environment. They have access to additional data that wasn't collected for the initial diagnosis. Um, so all kinds of other phenotype data because the consent of individuals involves their full lifetime record. There's also an additional sample that was collected for many of these patients that can also be accessed by researchers if they want to do, they want to uh, apply for funding for additional analysis. Um, this is where we are with this research side. So we launched right quite near the beginning of the project, um, this GSIP, Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnership. There's now more than 3000 researchers worldwide who have access to this environment. They've registered more than 400 projects and collectively across Genomics England, not just the research, but elsewhere, there's more than 130 publications and 24 grant applications. It's probably more than that now. Um, so almost 30 million pounds has been awarded to different researchers 
to do research alongside this data. Um, now, if you want to go and see the types of projects that are going on, you can of course apply to be part of this consortium and join one of these domains working on the data. Um, but you can also see the projects that they've registered. We have a new research portal and anyone can search this um, for the lay summaries. You have to be actually be a member to, um, to log in properly and see the full details of the projects. The idea is so that um, all the researchers have an idea of who's doing what and we reduce duplication and encourage collaboration between those researchers. What do you get when you log in? Because this is the whole point. Most of genomics in the past, particularly research genomics, research cohorts, the principle has been that you can download the data yourself. That's not the case here where the data is controlled. It's really health service data. So we provide an environment with data and documentation, with tools that you can do analysis with, and facilities for collaboration between individuals within the platform. Because of course, once you've logged into this virtual desktop interface, you can't see the internet anymore, except for a few sites which have been whitelisted read only. So if you want to export data from here, you can only export summary level data. Now, in terms of the actual data itself, there are regular data releases into this environment. Um, we've just done our 10th release and it has a large amount of secondary data, um, phenotype data about these patients contained, including now, of course, some COVID data around those participants that caught COVID and how they were affected. Um, so there's a very rich environment for people to analyze. And to give you an idea, you know, this is just a snapshot of some cancer patients. This is indicates the longitudinal record for these particular patients um, across many years before they became a participant in the 100,000 Genomes Project. And you can see, you know, the history of their conditions, including previous cancer treatments in many cases, which of course is useful for analyzing patterns of disease through genomes and phenomes. So for the GZIPs, there's lots of opportunities here. One of the reasons it's core Genomics England Interpretation Partnership is we would like one of the focuses of these researchers to help interpret the cases that we didn't get a diagnosis. We're getting diagnosis for maybe you know, 40, 50% of rare disease for cancer we're producing report that provides some useful information, even if it's only um, cancer, you know, the eligibility for cancer trials for around 50%. But there's a large number where it's unclear what the cause of the condition is. So there's lots of opportunities for researchers to, to analyze that and contribute and potentially send back um, candidates onto the clinical side as well as all the other things that you'd like them to do in terms of improving algorithms in general um, and investigating functions of variants where a variant has been identified as being potentially causal. That's lots of additional bioinformatics that could be developed into this frame as well. Um, in the future, we probably, the whole world will move from a reference genome to a graph genome structure, and we have to find better ways of handling variants at this sort of scale. As I'll say, we're going to go on to sequence from 100,000 to a million genomes over the next five years. So how to handle that data becomes an increasing problem. Um, I did mention that it's not just academics that are in this environment, it's also companies. Um, the, the only difference is, of course, they have to contribute to the costs of access, but it's the same rules as everybody else they can't take the data away. They have to analyze the data in place inside this environment. So just as a num set of numbers here, the key thing is in terms of health service integration, it's a large number of hospitals involved, large number of NHS staff. And that now points to the future because the end of 2018, our health secretary, Matt Hancock, announced that we would go on sequencing both in the NHS and also in 
um, you know, our large cohort. So over the next five years, the plan is to have half a million genomes for clinical care inside the genome medicine service, alongside a million and a half other genomic tests. There's already a large number of single gene panel tests. We only do whole genome sequencing when the standard tests don't produce a result. Um, but all of that data will be integrated together inside the genome medicine service, inside the infrastructure that's been built for Genomics England. Then in parallel with sequencing for clinical care, we have large numbers of cohorts and a very large cohort, UK Biobank. That's going to be sequenced as well. That process, that's already happening. And similarly, you know, the idea is that we will be able to link these together and end up with half a million research participants with deep phenotyping and half a million clinical care patients together. Um, there's in the plan for the future, the idea is to come up with quite a lot of extensions to the classic rare disease and cancer um, to look at other ways in which that we can benefit the health service such as sequencing newborns who have clear conditions, you know, illnesses, rapid sequencing to try and get quick diagnosis, as well as looking at the possibility of pharmacogenomics. So this is the future genome medicine service. There's a lot of infrastructure that's been built to support this because now this is no longer a short-term project, but a project which is gonna go on forever. So there's been hardening of the infrastructure to support this. And um, there's actually a testing framework so that anybody in the NHS can log in, select a test from a testing directory, and be pointed to the types of analysis that's available in the NHS, whether it's single gene or whole genome sequencing. Um, look up their patient from the centralized um, directory and build the pedigree and then carry out the sequencing. Now, this should have been deployed. But of course, everything has got delayed somewhat by COVID um, this year. So in fact, we've, in the meantime, we've initiated a new project um, while COVID is going on, which is in collaboration with many of the other groups in the UK and also internationally to sequence a large number of whole genomes of the worst affected COVID individuals and a companion mild the affected set to look for pattern of variation. So the plan is to sequence 35,000 genomes um, and to you know, have that as a data set um, that will provide insights into why some people are severely affected and others are very mildly affected. Now, in building that, um, it's worth saying a little bit about the research environment and how we've constructed it. Um, so you have a data center, you have patient records providing a clinical environment, which is part of the feedback to the NHS. But from the research side, we have an anonymized set of data, um, which is available through virtual desktop interfaces to patient to the, to the researchers. Now the genomes, they can't be de they can't be anonymized. They can only be de-identified. So they sit available to both research environments. And obviously, one of the differences of this sort of data center setup compared with um, other, you know, envir controlled environments like this is that it has high performance computing because you need that to be able to process these very large genomes. So there's a high performance computing environment where you can run analysis for research, just as you run analysis for clinical care. Now, that's what we have built in our initial environment that these 3,000 researchers have access to and about 1,000 are using right now. Um, but there's a problem of scalability in the long term as more and more people want to use it. So what we had been working on was the idea that we would progressively extend this and start making use of public cloud and do this in a way which can try, manages the same level of security. So if people log in um, and use the cloud, they do that within a sub part of our cloud account rather than having their own 
independent cloud account. So this was the sort of vision for making the whole research environment more scalable for the future. Now, I said COVID has come along. So we've actually used that as an opportunity to build a separate research environment for COVID built in this way using public cloud. So this is being tested right now. It's based on Amazon Web Services with a software interface within that environment to help manage the sort of cloud usage that you need to do. If you're going to have large numbers of people using the cloud, you need an interface for that. And that's been provided by this company, LifeBit. So this is what we're testing right now as a sort of evolution to doing controlled environments for large scale genomics. But it's not just genomes that we have to start thinking about if we're gonna think of the long term of analyzing health data in a controlled way um, to improve healthcare. I've talked about the 100,000 Genomes Project and the Genome Medicine Service, which is gonna expand from 100,000 to a million. Um, but you can also see the evolution in health records, the growth in device feedback, particularly with COVID, lots more devices are being deployed in the healthcare system in, at home, collecting data on patients to avoid them having to come to hospital, lots more patient reported outcomes, lots of image analysis, which is now starting to be analyzed with AI. So we have live in an environment of expanding healthcare data sets. And so to address that in the UK, we've set up a new institute. This was set up um, in 2018 and has been progressively getting going over this time and involving, of course, COVID. So the main point about this is it's not just science programs and training, but it's trying to upgrade the UK infrastructure for handling health data. It's hard enough to handle research cohort data and link it together. It's much harder once you start trying to get into real health service data. In this way, Genomics England has kind of pioneered a framework for doing that. But up to now, that's only been for this limited 100,000 individuals. We want to now expand that across the health sector as a whole. And so there is this vision of a structure where you have patients on one side and research users on the other side with data organized in a way that it's discoverable and then can be analyzed by researchers to improve healthcare. And so to do that, a separate organization within Health Data Research UK has been set up the Health Data Research Alliance, and this includes all of the healthcare data providers in the UK. There's a gateway, so each of those members one of the things they have to produce is metadata descriptions of all these data sets. And there's always a gate, already a gateway which you can use um, to explore what data sets are available. There's already more than almost 500 data sets registered in this gateway. So for example, you could put in the keyword COVID and see all the data sets that already exist around COVID data. Now this doesn't mean you can access that data, but it provides pointers to how you can access. And how can you access this when it's, um, when it's uh, data that's controlled? Well, we think that this framework that we've constructed for the 100,000, which we're now referring to as a trusted research environment, is the future. This follows a general principle called the five safes. Um, so you have safe people, assessment of who gets access, safe project, a structure of oversight of what the projects are um, with committees that include representatives of patients. You have a safe setting, which is this environment where data is not distributed. You have to log in and use it. Safe output controls around what can be exported in terms of summaries that are not identifiable and a system for ensuring that the data that goes into that environment is safe that it's been properly de-identified. So even within the controlled environment, researchers can't see what that is. And then this extension, safe computing, when you start to use public cloud computing in a way um, that's also secure, but allows scalability as the data sets become very, very large. There's one particular extra thing that 
Genomics England has managed, which is we're referring to a safe return. The idea that researchers might identify individual patients, extra information, which can then be fed back to the health service. Um, the researchers don't know who those patients are, but they can send messages back to the clinical side if they discover something which wasn't previously identified in the automatic analysis that's been done for clinical care. So this framework um, we've set out in a green paper and you can go and look at that. And we're seeing that as a way of doing things in a way that is trusted by patients because it's based on data not being distributed. And it sets out the you know, arguments for this structure and how you might set one up. So the idea in the Alliance, Health Data Research Alliance, is that we have this gateway so you can discover the data sets. Those data sets will mainly live in trusted research environments. And over time, we'll build a structure for federating them together. So even if you can't move the data between these environments, you can at least do joint analysis across them. Um, so that's the summary of what I've talked about. I've talked about the 100K project, which is now really finished, but it's leading on now to a future of a million genomes and more genomic tests um, uh, in the future of the Genome Medicine Service. And I talked about the research that's been enabled by setting up infrastructure in a way that supports that as well as clinical care. Um, obviously, all of us have now been distracted with COVID, um, but that's created new research activities. And in the case of Genomics England, we're actually using that partly as a way of exploring other ways of setting up research environments that are more scalable, um, more rapidly deployable. If you use the public cloud, it means researchers don't have to worry about limited limitations of HPC because they can always spin up more nodes to do more analysis as they need, which is highly suitable for an emergency situation such as COVID. And I talked about how we're taking this forward um, much more widely for um, handling um, health data in general in the UK and the sort of future direction of trusted research environments. So I just want to acknowledge there's obviously huge numbers of people involved, the team at Genomics England, which is now the more than 200, but the NHS teams as well, Health Education England, I haven't talked about the educational side of this, Public Health England applying infections and Health uh, NHS England that runs um, the whole contracting framework of the NHS. There's large numbers of individual groups, particularly in cohorts that have contributed to this, particularly at the start of the program. And then the wider pattern, Health Data Research UK, there's a London consortium of universities that I haven't really talked about. Um, and of course, my historical connections with Sanger and EBI. And of course, I'm based at King's. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have received several questions uh, from the audience in the chat, which I will uh, read to you. Um, in the meantime, uh, if there are still questions, please uh, post them in the chat. Um, so first of all, I have a question from uh, Peter Bamatoui. Uh, who would be interested to learn more about the consent uh, that is asked to the patient? So is there a special consent asked for research? And can participants also allow or deny commercial uh, companies to access their data? So the structure of the 100,000 was the ethics was a special, um, special designation which allowed a single consent because it was a kind of experimental investigation project, uh, which allowed clinical care and research access as a single consent. But that was because it was a special project. And you know, that also of course included commercial access, but within this framework of not distributing the data. Going forward in the NHS, the new genome medicine service, there will be two consents. There will be a consent for 
clinical care using whole genome sequencing, but every patient will also be provided with the option of a separate consent for research. And you know, so they can then in the, in the genome medicine service opt out of research if they want to, but they'll lose certain benefits from that if, because they won't get the benefits of the researchers analyzing their genomes and potentially providing additional insights. So we don't know exactly how that will go. We anticipate you know, in you know, the other optional consent we had before, which was around secondary findings, 85% of people consented to that. But certainly there won't be an option to opt out of commercial. It will be, do you want to take part of research or not? Thank you. Um, another question um, from Ruben Koch. So his question is, um, our Ministry of Health in the Netherlands regards genomics as still primarily in the science domain. I wonder what convinced the NHS in the UK to start this massive clinical genomics program. So to what extent is there an active collaboration between ministries of health and science around Genomics England and HDR UK? And how does this reach, bridge research and care? So I think that actually is one of the key points of this project. And you know, we've been doing this now for seven years and given the number of ministries from different countries that have visited us, you know, it's been surprising that no other country has really implemented a similar program integrated into the health service. In the UK, we have had very strong collaborations between all these ministries and all the components of the health service. And that's partly been brought together because we had a prime minister who had a child who died of a rare disease and was committed to this. And of course, if you're the prime minister, then you can implement collaborations between ministries. So in fact, there was a joint minister across health, across the health ministry and the science ministry specifically for this kind of project. And I think following on from that, you know, there have been other mechanisms previously in the planning phase, something called the Office of Strategic Coordination of Health Research, which also brings the health ministry and the science ministries together. Um, so there's been quite a lot of progress, I think, in that bridging that gap, because that really is a gap. Um, but, you know, now we have an environment where health data can be analyzed by researchers um, securely, and we have a framework for extending that across health data in general. Thank but you. it's certainly something that was very difficult to get going. Just uh, looking at what other questions we've received. Um, so there are a couple of additional questions um, regarding um, yeah, the security of data sharing. Um, there's a question from uh, Leon May from LUMC, Leiden. Uh, so you mentioned that, um, uh, you mentioned about whitelisting at the virtual machine to allow only summary data to be downloaded. Um, and uh, Leon mentioned that uh, he has had similar discussions within uh, BBMRI and L. Um, so the worst case scenario could be that people could take a snapshot uh, from their screen on sensitive information, uh, which you can't really control within a, a virtual machine. He admits that this is a bit paranoid, um, but he wonders if this has ever been discussed within the um, 100,000 uh, Genomes project, and if you have any suggestions on how to deal with such an uh, extreme scenario. So firstly, the, um, everything that a researcher sees is de-identified. And if it's phenotype data where it can be, it's also un anonymized, you know. So the information available to researchers is to some extent limited. All the researchers, of course, have signed an agreement saying that they won't try and re-identify. And, you know, they've They've signed that and their institutions have signed that they take responsibility for their researchers as well. 
So there's kind of there's a combination of technological systems and you know legal structures around this. Now you can't stop people taking screenshots, but you can the virtual desktop interface does stop you doing cut and paste, for example. And the whitelisting, the structure is that those are read-only whitelisting. So you can implement through firewalls systems, you know, on the new environment, for example, we can interface with GitHub and Docker Hub, but those are read-only interfaces. So researchers can't check stuff back into GitHub or Docker Hub from the environment because that would be a potential path for data leaking back. In terms of what you can export, you can't export automatically anything. It goes by an, an airlock mechanism, which, in, which is a workflow, which has manual review, process, tracking, um, you know, keeping copies, etc. So there's quite strong systems in place, um, technological blocks, legal blocks. It's not perfect if you have a malicious individual, but certainly the you know patients in terms of engagement with them you know there have been multiple engagements you know big ones and this kind of style that the data is not shared it's just accessible um that framework seem people seem much more comfortable with particularly commercials one of the things that where um where patients are concerned about commercials having their data is that they have a copy of the data. If the data isn't actually distributed, people feel much more comfortable with commercial analysis going on to lead to healthcare. Because also, of course, if you have this environment, you can watch what your researchers are doing potentially. And of course, you know what they've done to some extent because of what they request to export. Thank you very much. Um, I'm receiving a question from, well, I cannot see actually the name from uh, whom this question comes, but um, from a clinical point of view, what additional percentage of patients is diagnosed due to the fact that genomes are sequenced instead of exomes? Right. So the... I mean, we'd, we haven't a large amount of exome sequencing. We've jumped to whole genome, but certainly, you know, in the classic whole you know, single gene tests, panels, there've been about 800 tests in the health service prior to whole genome sequencing. Um, the diagnostic rate there was, you know, around 20%. Um, our estimates is that whole genome sequencing, when you don't have a diagnosis, all of these patients here, they are the ones where you didn't get a diagnosis from, from those existing tests, you gain another 20% at least for rare diseases. So you're kind of doubling your diagnostic rate in the health service. Now, this is of course not a comparison with exomes, but we do find that one of the benefits of this is that whole genome sequencing, it's PCR free sequencing, it's much cleaner than an exome. And so actually, you get a better quality exome through this approach of whole genome sequencing, you know, if you're just analyzing the exome, then by exome sequencing. Um, in terms of diagnosis outside the protein coding regions, which of course is, you know, that's potentially the benefit, long-term benefit of whole genome sequencing, we are starting to get diagnosis in regulatory regions um, and upstream regions that wouldn't be captured by an exome. So to some extent, this is chicken and egg. People, if you just have exome data, you don't build up experience of how to diagnose outside those regions. Here, we, you know, we, partly we've done whole genome sequencing to build up the data that will help improve the mechanisms for interpretation of the future. Thank you. To follow up uh, on this question, um, question from uh, Alain. How do you view the value of genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics uh, platforms in genomics England? So there's a where you know we've only financed to do sequencing. That's 
that's been the mechanism. Um, now, of course, there's other things you can do. Um, in terms of the research side, many of these samples, there is a biobank sample and researchers can raise money through grant applications to do additional analysis on those data sets for research purposes. But right now, there's no deployment of any other you know, systematic testing on top of just the whole genome sequencing. Um, you know, I was asked you know, before there was a comment about why has this got done? Why have we managed to implement this? Um, why is the health service accepted to continue? This is based on health economics. And I think that certainly the framework we use for evaluating the new treatments in the UK and w whole genome sequencing is essentially a new treatment is what does the health economics look like? And so any additional test that you want to systematically deploy, that's the test you have to deploy. Um, and for diagnosis in rare disease and cancer, some cancers, whole genome sequencing has passed that test, a lot more research will be needed to justify other types of analysis. Thank you. Um, another question from Ilse Kusters. So you mentioned that after sequencing 100,000 genomes, uh, it proved to be worthwhile to implement into healthcare. Could you provide some more insight into these arguments? So that's really what I said, that we have a mechanism of what's called um, um, you know, uh, of, of operationalizing a new technology, which is based on health economics. So, you know, as part of the research framework, there were, there is a health economics domain in this research framework. And one of the early outputs from that was the evaluation of the benefit to the healthcare system of doing the 100,000 genomes, uh, which sped into the decision-making process of the health service to make this into standardized care. Right, thank you. Um, we have a bit of time left and I still have some questions um, coming in. Um, so there was also another question from uh, Peter Van der Hoen. So his question is, uh, does the 100k genomes project also participate in beacon uh, or matchmaker exchange activities? If not, why not? Uh, beacons are another way of giving limited access to data without actually seeing the data. Yeah, so genome is part of the Global Alliance for Genomes and Health, and it's actually a driver project for one of the, um, you know, one of those projects. Um, we haven't got round to setting up a beacon, but we don't see any problems in, I mean, we, we will at some point, you know, distribute summary allele frequencies from the project, um, you know, alongside alle other allele frequencies that have been released. And the idea of a beacon where you can ask questions of the data and get back results, which are you know, non-disclosative, that's also possible. Um, it just, you know, it hasn't been implemented. But it fits with the idea of federated analysis, um, which also fits with our plans for Health Data Research UK. Thanks. Then I would like to uh, conclude uh, with one more question. Um, so what are your lessons learned that we could use as the Netherlands Cross Omics Initiative? Um, so, you know, I think one of the one of the key problems that other countries have had has been bridging between health and research. And you know, many places I've given talks, the researchers have been all enthusiastic, um, but they don't understand how difficult it is to deploy something in a health service. And similarly, the healthcare you know isn't convinced that this is of value, and it takes a long process you know this process in the uk started um you know started really with the drop in price and sequencing there was a house of lords report in 2009 which said you know this is going to become relevant for healthcare 
And then there was a government response, 2010, the Human Genome Strategy Group, which produced a report in 2012, which essentially, you know, how would you implement this in the health service? And then at the end of 2012, there was the announcement. Um, so it's been a long process of engagement with all the different groups. And throughout the project, you know, there are stakeholders, not just patients and the public, but the clinicians. There's been a huge engagement process and a parallel education process in terms of training as well. So I think you have to do all those things. You have to be prepared for a long process of engagement and political will to bring the different sides together, which of course is, is difficult to manage. But, uh, and of course it's easier, slightly easier for us in the UK because we have a single health service and they do have processes for deploying new technologies, um, you know, commissioning those technologies, um, which is of course harder if you have insurance systems with multiple insurance providers. So engagement, I would say. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now handing over to uh, Alain. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for your extended uh, question and the answers that, that you gave. It was very informative. Engagement, that's uh, like with a capital E that stands out with, uh, with this talk. So thank you very much. And, you know, we have this kind of weird online thing, but uh, I'd like to applaud you with the Zoom app. <laughs> so we'll restart at 10.45 sharp. We have, as I mentioned, four young investigators, and I'll put up the program in the coffee break, um, the more extended program. We we'll talk about various uh, case studies and various examples, how the omics was applied in, the, um, uh, in their research. And we're going to mix this with uh, technology pitches from three companies, Nanostring, Bruker, and uh, Microsoft. We're going to elucidate more about uh, their particular analytical platforms or data platforms that can support us as a community. And um, it's going to be an interesting one. Again, there won't be any questions and answers. Um, you can approach the speakers directly or approach us if you have particular needs. Um, and what I'd like to um, emphasize as well that our sponsors actually, uh, which I'd like to thank very much for um, supporting this, this, um, this event, have put uh, several pieces of information on the website. So if you go to the Crossomics Festival and you scroll down, you see several uh, um, access points to the, to the sponsors where you can access their information. Um, but there won't be any breaks. We'll make the time very sharp to finish there um, at 12 uh, when we have the lunch break. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, please switch off your cameras again and we'll restart at 10.45 sharp. Thank you. <laughs>